Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the next in our Government 2023 Conference of Events. And thanks again to Grant Thornton for making it possible. I'm Emma Norris, I'm the Deputy Director at the Institute for Government and I'm delighted to be hosting a keynote speech from Lisa Nandy, MP, on Labour's plans to devolve power out of Whitehall to fix the economy and the broken political system. So, um, Lots of range there. Um, devolution and levelling up have, of course, been a core part of the government's agenda for a few years now, although it didn't feature too much in the current Prime Minister's list of priorities the other day. And Labour have put devolution of power and tackling regional inequality at the heart of their pitch too. It was, of course, the centrepiece of Keir Starmer's start of the year speech. And Lisa, it's not only your shadow brief, but also the subject of a book you published um, at the end of last year. I'm sure that Lisa needs no introduction, but of course I am going to give one anyway. Um, Lisa was elected as the Labour MP for Wigan in 2010. Um, she is the Shadow Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing and Communities and has done a whole range of briefs um, in the Shadow Cabinet. Lisa is also the co-founder of the think tank Centre for Towns, which was set up to ensure the priority and visibility was given to Britain's towns alongside all the other structures. And she published All In last year, a book that's been described as a manifesto for giving power back to the people and maps out what a different settlement between government, people, business and civil society might look like. Before entering Parliament, Lisa worked for the youth homelessness charity Centrepoint and the Children's Society. There you go, potted you history, know Lisa. Everything about me now, <laughs> apart from my two <laughs> uh, So we're going to, of course, kick off with Lisa's speech. Then I'm going to ask a few questions. We'll have some back and forth, and then I'll make sure that I leave at least 25 minutes um, for questions from the audience. I know that there will be lots. If you're joining us online, please do send in your questions anytime from now and via Slido. The code, if you haven't heard it already, is hashtag ifggov23, and I'll make sure I ask as many of your questions as possible. So, Lisa, without further ado, Lovely. over to you. Well, thanks very much. And I have to say, looking out into the audience, I've just realised that I've borrowed <coughs> and lent on the expertise of about half of the people in this room over the last year since I was asked to take on this brief by Keir Starmer. So if you don't like it, you only have yourselves to blame. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can't go on like this, and I think that we all know it. We've had 13 years of virtually no growth we can't fund our public services, chief amongst them the National Health Service, once the crown jewel of our public services, now systematically run down to the point where millions of people can't get the treatment they need and patients lie on floors in accident and emergency departments across the country. Our local economies are falling apart in many places. Our high streets are to communities what the A&E is to the health service. It's the warning light that flashes on the dashboard to say that something has gone fundamentally wrong in the wider system. And behind every boarded up high street is a local economy that is failing. Failing to grow, failing to put money into people's pockets, failing to give young people choices and chances so they don't have to get out to get on. This is our failure in politics and government, not theirs. We are failing. And after a decade of decay and decline, lots of things need reform, but the political system chief amongst them. We can't even guarantee in this country what should be a basic human right. A decent, secure home is a basic human right. But home ownership is falling, mortgage rates and rents are soaring, a million people languish on social housing waiting lists, and the government is currently at the mercy of backbenchers who will and have blocked any signs of progress in this parliament. We're in the middle of an energy revolution, and we're failing at that too. There's no greater sign of this failure than the decision to reopen a coal mine at a time when Britain is trying to persuade the world to cut carbon emissions and fast. These are the insular, short-sighted, sticking plaster solutions to wholly foreseeable problems that have come to characterise this government. Energy security compromised, leaving us at the mercy of global markets and clean energy jobs going overseas. For an island nation, this is an absurd place to find ourselves. And every major challenge in this country comes back to one thing, that we've written off the talent, the potential and the assets of most of our people in almost every part of Britain. This is not just a tragedy. It is a social crime. No part of Britain can succeed unless we grow our economy in every place, not just some. You can build a world-class financial sector in London, 
but you can't create a game-changing wind industry. For that, you have to look to Fife, you have to look to Grimsby. And these waves of political upheaval that we've experienced, the rising nationalism, the vote to leave the European Union, these were the sound of people who are demanding to take charge of their own destiny again. They have a contribution to make and they have a right to see that realised. And credit to the Tories because they stepped into this void with a slogan that spoke to the moment. To solve a problem, you have to see it. And they saw it and gave voice to it and it propelled them to power in 2019. But after four years, all we have to show for it is a 297-page treatise on the history of the Roman Empire. A government that is going backwards on its own missions, a year on from the announcement that there would be levelling up directors in every part of this country, and not a single one is in post. The single biggest impact that they've made on the levelling up agenda has been to crash the economy, fueling inflation, that has wiped out the value of the meagre levelling up funds that were on offer. So no more excuses. We will succeed where successive governments have failed in various ways to varying degrees for a century. And we'll do so for one simple reason. Ending a century of centralisation and unleashing the power of all people in all parts of Britain is no longer a nice to have, a local or a regional issue. It is at the heart of whether this country has a future or not. It is the only way to heal a fractured and divided nation. It is the only way to build an economy that works for most of us again, so we can fund our public services and sustain thriving, inclusive places. In short, it is the only way to build a country that works. Now, you might be forgiven for thinking that you've heard some of this before. Why would you trust us? when you've had dozens of different versions of enterprise zones over the last 30 years, regional assemblies that were never realised, an endless round of press releases about the Northern Powerhouse and every single promise made since 2010 broken, and a Hunger Games-style contest that forces communities to compete for small sums of their own money back after a decade of resources being stripped from every part of the country. Well, I'll tell you why. Because rather than leave this to one department, one minister, or the whim of the next Tory Prime Minister to take office, we're going to bake this into our first two terms of government, across the whole of government. And today, I want to tell you a little bit about how. Firstly, we'll introduce a Take Back Control Act that is already in the process of being drafted and will be ready to go in government. The centrepiece of that legislation will be to flip the presumption of power. Instead of communities begging Westminster for powers, the government of the day will be under a legal obligation to explain why not. And if there are reasons why not, they'll have to set out a plan for communities to take back control of their own destiny and work with them to realise that ambition. So that by the end of the first term of a Labour government, every part of Britain that wants it will be able to access powers over skills, employment support and housing that support their local communities, to invest in the rail, tram and buses that they need, with the right to drive major infrastructure projects, not from Westminster, but from South Yorkshire, Cornwall and Teesside, working together across political boundaries, because if Northern Powerhouse Rail have been in the hands of the North without constant interference from government, you can bet we would have delivered it by now. And this is how we'll rebuild the national economy, through local growth, drawing on the unique strengths of our brilliantly diverse country, driven by communities and their leaders, with support from their government. A government that matches the ambition that is still found in every community in this country. Secondly, we'll change how we judge our success. The levelling up white paper drew on the most interesting work in the field, from the work of pioneers like Diane Coyle, Matthew Agawala, Partha Dasgupta, to develop the six capitals which form the foundation of thriving places with strong local communities. But a few pages later, and these were recycled into vague, disingenuous measures of success. They tell us nothing about whether we're creating strong local economies, 
or thriving, sustainable communities. A country where every place is once again able to make a contribution to the national effort. And as the Institute for Governance said themselves, they wouldn't reduce regional inequality even if they were met. In short, they tell us little about the problem that levelling up was designed to solve. And apart from anything else, it is fundamentally dishonest to introduce measures of success without definition, ambition, clarity, or even the faintest idea of how you're going to go about meeting them. We believe in mission-led government, but these must be backed by a plan. And on most of the existing missions, this government isn't just failing, it's going backwards. Well, we're calling time on this. We say, if you can't deliver it, don't write it down. Thomas Jefferson once said that the care of human life is the first and only task of government. To achieve longer, healthier, happier lives, blighted by less crime and supported by good public services. But to do that, you have to get every part of this country working again. Choices and chances for all of our people in every place, not just some. So we will introduce measures to show us whether we are achieving what we set out to do on levelling up strong local economies and thriving sustainable communities in every part of Britain. To help us do this, we'll establish an independent advisory council drawn from every part of the UK to monitor our progress towards a country where every part of Britain can contribute again to our collective success. And we'll base this upon metrics which will be centred around the following principles. Firstly, resilience in local, regional and national communities, economies. Where are we overly reliant on one local employer or one sector or too few parts of Britain? Does every region and nation have access to a broad range of financial capital and investment? Where is there the least resilience in family finances, where so many families are only one payday away from a crisis? Because without resilience, people and places are far too exposed to these largely unforeseen economic shocks. Whether it's the global pandemic, whether it's the global financial crash, whether it's the Liz Trust government, those people and those places end up paying a very heavy price for a lack of resilience baked into their local economies. Secondly, connectivity which is essential to levelling up, to education, to training, to work, to healthcare, to family and to friends. You walk into any part of Britain outside of the major cities and you'll find the first thing that people talk to you about is buses. Why? Not because we're obsessed with buses, although I have to confess that perhaps I am, but because this is what connects us to our friends, to our families, to jobs, to work, to opportunity. This is the difference between a kid being able to take up an apprenticeship or not. This is the difference between whether you get home on time to read your kids a bedtime story or not. This is the difference to whether local economies work or not. And we include this broadest range of connectivity, healthcare, family, friends amongst them, because prosperity is not just material consumption. Do people have the ability to live the richer, larger, more dignified lives without having to leave the place they call home? Social connectedness is lower in London and our major cities than in other parts of the UK. Doesn't this suggest we might be getting something wrong for our cities as well as for our towns? Thirdly, sustainability. This is the one measure that seems to feature least in this government's plans. Are we building something that can last, that can help us create and sustain the country that we need? The pandemic exposed the risk of omitting nature from economic calculations. It is madness that you can add to GDP by chopping down a forest, but not by protecting the wildlife and natural capital that give us clean air, green space, and protection from pandemics. If we were measuring success, by looking beyond the next 10 years. We would be investing in new nuclear in Cumbria with thousands of jobs that will last for decades, not reopening a coal mine to create hundreds of jobs that are already being phased out. And finally, well-being. Once there was a consensus on this from Blair and Brown to Cameron and Osborne. But in this short-term Westminster knows all era, the people have been cut out of the conversation. But how people feel about their own lives can tell us a lot about whether we're getting this right. How do people feel about their ability to influence their lives, their communities and their country? How do they feel about the institutions that serve them? 
Are we building communities that match the needs and ambitions of the people who live in them? Now, a cynic might say this government has no interest in measuring this sort of progress because they have no plan to deliver it. I couldn't possibly comment. But measuring success is one of the great weaknesses of politics as a whole. While businesses across Britain use a dashboard of measures to gauge their success, as politicians, we're stuck with analogue measures in a digital age, trying to measure 21st century progress using what The Economist Diane Coyle calls 20th century statistics. But if we adjusted the lens, the things that matter would come back into focus. And thirdly, and finally, we'll go wide and deep. Where the Tories have remained wedded to a model of growth and devolution based on city-led growth that has not served either our towns, our villages or our cities well, we will spread power and opportunity wider and deeper. In government, our policies will be assessed for their spatial dimension and the contribution they make to building strong local economies and tackling some of the worst intra- and inter-regional inequality in the world. We're prepared to think differently about how to do this. The Gordon Brown Commission, for example, recommended that we enshrine constitutionally protected social rights for all of our citizens that guarantee minimum standards and public services for all of us, not just some, in all places, not just some. Because without this, the risk is that we'll revert to the habits that have served us all badly for far too long and continue to invest in the places where we get more bang for our buck, leaving some to pull further and further ahead, while others continue to fall further and further behind. We can't and we won't go on like this. Britain is almost unique in trying to power a modern economy using only a handful of people in a handful of sectors in a few parts of the country. And even the so-called winners are losing. It's at times like this, when things feel so fundamentally broken, that real change becomes possible. And that is why we will rise to this moment of national renewal, not to be defeated by the clamour for change, but to meet that ambition for change and oversee a great rebalancing of power and prosperity across the whole of the United Kingdom. This is at the heart of our nation's future and it is this recognition that this is the only route out of our national malaise that gives me the confidence that we'll succeed this time. Every problem our country faces comes back to this central recognition and that is why the time for excuses is long past there is no alternative and failure is not an option thank you very much Lisa, thank you for what a rich wide-ranging um, and fascinating speech we've got a lot to, to talk about so in that speech, you announced some changes uh, to the way that the current government is doing things on levelling up. Um, I think scrapping the, the 12 missions approach. And I'm especially pleased to hear you um, announce Labour's plan for an advisory council, which um, is something that IFG itself has recommended on our work in levelling up. Something I'm wondering is, though, sitting kind of above advisory councils and, and what it is that you're measuring, do your headline objectives, do Labour's headline objectives for levelling up, actually differ from the Conservatives? And if so, how do they differ and, and why? Um, I think there's a real confusion at the heart of this government about what levelling up is, is and the problem that it was designed to solve. And I think, in part, that goes back to the fact that, you know, it's often said that you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. And levelling up was a great bit of campaigning poetry onto which you could project whatever you wanted... Um, that hasn't translated very well into prose under the current government. I've always been very clear about the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, we can't continue to try to run a major country and a modern economy by writing off the contribution of most people in most parts of Britain. It doesn't serve any of us well. You know, a million people move to London every year looking for new opportunities, higher wages, the, the region of the country where you find the highest wages. Uh, 20 years ago, I was one of them. And I found those higher wages, I found those opportunities, but I also found the cripplingly high housing costs that come from trying to push more and more young people into small parts of the country. We've overheated some parts of our country 
whilst we've undercooked others. Mm -hmm. And it's cost us dear in every part of the United Kingdom. That's why we call it a great rebalancing of power and opportunity, because um, I think there is now a recognition that we just simply can't go on like this. So good jobs back into communities that haven't had them, resilience into local economies, strong local economies with thriving, sustainable communities. Because I believe that if you hand power to people who have a stake in the outcome and skin in the game, who are in it for the long haul, they will build a country that works. But for too long, we've had a small group of people with a tight grip on power and resources who haven't been able to see the potential in those places and in those people. They see only problems. Well, that's got to change. And I think we can succeed where others have failed, not least because we've learned from what successive governments, both Conservative and Labour, have got wrong and what they've got right. We don't intend, for example, to start building new institutions and new political models. We think governance arrangements should reflect the economic geography, the assets and the circumstances of different places. We're comfortable with messiness and diversity in political governance arrangements because in any democracy worth its salt, people have to consent to their own governance, not have it imposed on them from the centre. But where we are prescriptive is that the powers that are on offer to some should be on offer to all. It shouldn't be the case that a young person in Barnsley can't get a bus to an apprenticeship and his local leaders can do nothing about it while a kid in Bolton can, simply because a minister likes the look of the mayor of Greater Manchester more than the mayor of South Yorkshire. I mean, that's just unacceptable. And so that is our guarantee and commitment to people in this country that by the end of the first term of a Labour government, those opportunities will be on offer to all and not just some. Brilliant. Thank you. I want to pick up on the point around kind of accessing powers and how you give those powers to communities. You talked about introducing a take-back control bill that would flip the kind of legal obligation so government has to explain why it's not giving powers rather than why it is if it chooses not to. But how would you go about giving out those powers? You know, is Labour's vision to maintain the institutions that have already been built, so essentially to complete the mayoral map, if you like, or are you talking about a greater diversity of, of institutions holding some of that power? So we think that the potential for the greatest local growth lies somewhere between the very local and the national. Um, so take the work that's going on in uh, the Humber region at the moment. Extraordinary, game-changing investment going into Hull and parts of the Humber that create supply chains that stretch all the way up to the northeast and help make a significant contribution to our energy needs, to our uh, climate emergency, uh, and you know, rebuilding local economies. Um, the scale at which that, that works is not at one local authority level, mm -hmm. but it has to involve, and I'm looking over here in particular, um, it, it has to involve it has to involve local elected leaders. So, you know, in Grimsby, for example, you've got local authorities working together across local authority boundaries in order to, to pursue economic regeneration. In Greater Manchester, you've got a city-led regional model. Now, you know, we have a live debate going on in Greater Manchester about that, but um, it, we have a major city, and that you know, that's created a structure around which the local authorities can, can work together. In other parts of the country, that simply doesn't exist. So, you know, our, our offer to, the, to, to leaders across the country is come to us and talk to us about the governance arrangements that you need, and those powers will be on offer. And if we can't hand over those powers and resources, we'll work with you to create the path to help realise that ambition. Uh, it, it can't be done overnight. That's, you know, we're, we're realistic about the challenges. But we do believe, having spent time with local, lead, local political leaders, local business leaders, uh, civil society in every part of the country, that by the end of the first term of a Labour government, we can achieve it. But I think part of what you're talking about is very long-term change, the kind of vision that you set out today, Lisa, and what we heard from Keir Starmer um, earlier this year, is the kind of change that can take years, if not decades, to really embed that kind of redistribution of power from central to, to regional and local. Um, and I think, you know, today, completely understandably, you've outlined the differences between what, Labour, what Labour's vision is and, and what the kind of current Conservative vision is. But given it's a vision that will take years and probably multiple electoral cycles to really embed and make last, 
how will you go about ensuring that what Labour is setting out can last over the long term? You know, will you work with the Conservatives to secure that lasting change? Would you sign up to a cross-party initiative on levelling up with Michael Gove? Yeah, I mean, like, let, let me give you an example. Um, if you run a local council, you don't refuse to work with local businesses, with developers, with civil society organisations, and you don't refuse to work, actually, if you've got any sense, with uh, other political leaders. You, you don't look at your neighbouring council and think they're a different colour to me, I'm not going to talk to them about how we revive our local economies. You work with whoever it takes in order to deliver change for the people that you represent, because they can't wait, mm -hmm. and neither can you. Well, that's the approach that we ought to be taking in government. You know, there are mayors across the country who've been elected by their people who are conservative. Well, we respect that. There's a, a government in Scotland that has been elected by the people that is a Scottish nationalist government. We respect democracy, and you work with the leaders that people have chosen themselves in order to deliver that change. Now, I think there's a pragmatism there that is found more often at local level than it's found at national level. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, I've had many conversations with Michael Gove about levelling up and about the challenges that he's faced in the Conservative Party and whether some of those challenges will exist for us in government. I've talked to uh, most Conservative and Labour Secretaries of State who in one way and another have been responsible for this agenda over the last two decades. I've talked to people from all over the world of different political persuasions about how this is working in the United States, in Germany, in France, in Austria. The, you know, many of these challenges are global challenges, not just uh, British challenges. And we will learn from whoever it takes because when I said that this is the only route out of our current crisis, I was deadly serious about that. There is no alternative for Britain <coughs> other than to, to use this moment of crisis as a moment of national renewal. And that means we need to tap into the creativity and the energy and the ideas of everybody in our country, not just some. Thank you. I'm going to come to the audience in just a minute, but I also wanted even to ask Dems. about <laughs> central... Sorry, I just spotted Duncan in the audience. So I said, even the Lib Dems, <laughs> in case you didn't catch that. <laughs> joke, joke. I wanted to talk... <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk about um, your book a bit too, Lisa, and this links to what you're talking about today. Um, in the book, you capture, I think, a sense of a kind of... a wider sense of civic powerlessness in much of the, of the UK today. And we've talked about what that means for devolving power. We've perhaps talked a little bit less about what that means for Westminster itself. Um, you know, how do you think our central political system can undo that powerlessness? And is, for instance, voting reform off the table for Labour? Um, uh, I mean, we're currently going through a process of writing the manifesto of looking at everything um, that we want to deliver in government. And the only criteria that Keir has set, well, uh, two criteria, one is that we've got to be able to know how we're going to pay for it. It's people's money, they haven't got a lot of it, and we're going to spend every penny wisely. But secondly, that we've got to know that we can deliver it in the first two terms of a Labour government. If, it's, if you can't, it's not going in the manifesto. Mm. And so, to, to, to that extent, nothing is off the table, um, unless it doesn't meet those two criteria. But I think what you can see is, a, is an agenda forming that aims to put power into the right hands so that we can start to drive growth from every part of the country and allow people to make the contribution that they want to again. In his speech last week, Keir said, for far too long, for most of the country outside of London in the South East, there's only been a one-word plan, redistribution. Now, it's my belief that in those, particularly in those coastal and industrial towns like Wigan, where I live, that that has, you know, although that had huge effects for particular groups of people, you, you know, children growing up in poverty, older people facing pensioner poverty, that redistribution made a, a huge and significant impact on our public services and what we we're able to achieve in terms of educational outcomes and healthcare. It, that, that, that contribution that people made within living memory, within living memory, people in places like Wigan and Grimsby were at the centre of the world. We powered the world through dangerous, difficult work in the mines and in the mills and in the factories and the steelworks. And that sense of contribution, that pride, that purpose, that, that being at the centre of our national story 
that is what has been lost and that is what stings for so many people. They want a better future on offer for their children than the sort of delivery driver jobs that don't pay enough to raise a family on, that don't offer that security and don't offer that sense of contribution again. That's what we've written off. That's what we've written out of the national story. And that's, I believe, what lies at the heart of these political upheavals that we've experienced in recent years. People have to have a stake in the future of this country. It's not just that they need to benefit from what we create, it's that they have a right to create it and drive it and shape it themselves. So how do you do that? Do you do that through electoral reform? One of the ideas that I floated in the book was about having, you know, why are we debating PR at national level but not at local and regional level where often in many parts of the country you only have one party states and the absence of that local democracy is felt very keenly. Mm -hmm. But the, the reform that I most want to see and that I think you could tell from today that Keir and Rachel and I are most focused on is putting the tools and levers of economic growth that create thriving, sustainable places where high streets are working because the local economy is working again and young people have choices and chances so they don't have to get out to get on. That is the change that we want We've, we, we are determined that we're going to deliver in two terms of a Labour government. Thank you. OK, I think we've got just under 25 minutes left. So as promised, I'm going to go out to the audience. I'm going to take questions um, in groups of three. Please um, say your name and which organisation you're from. Um, start just over here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Grace Duffy from the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so great to have you. So I was wondering if you could tell us um, a little bit more about your views on uh, how we address the problems in the housing market, um, particularly the role of the private rented sector. I was um, particularly struck by the comment you made about housing being a human right and how that relates to the sort of view of not just the private rented sector, but housing as either a financial product or as an investment and, and how that kind of relates to the the human rights thing. Um, also, as someone who recently moved out of London, just strong agree on the buses. It is such an enormous source of frustration. Thank you. Thank you. And one at the back here. Hi, um, Oscar Bentley, BBC News. Um, does Labour think the government was wrong to use Section 35 of the Scotland Act to, Scot to stop uh, Scotland's new gender reform laws? Thank you. And then one here at the front. Hi, James Jamison, Chairman of the Local Government Association. If we're going to have devolution, it's not just about powers, it's about money. And every year we have to go and beg the Treasury for money. What are you going to do to help local government raise money locally? In the UK, we raise about 8% locally. Germany, Holland, Switzerland, blah, blah. They're way above 20%. What local taxes or sales taxes would Labour propose would become local? Thank you very much. OK, so we've got um, the housing market, particularly the private rented sector. How will you help local government actually raise the money that it needs? And then, of course, the um, question on whether government was right to block Scotland's gender reform bill. God, gender it's like reform. maths A level. <laughs> that didn't end very well for me, to be honest. Um, OK, um, so uh, on the question about housing um, uh, and housing as a human right, Everything about our housing market is currently broken. And I think that is in part because we've treated it as a market rather than the, the foundation of decent, secure lives and uh, sustainable communities. And so we want to do a, a few things in government. The first is that we want to restore, uh, we want to increase home ownership. So Keir set out a target of 70% of home ownership um, uh, that we'll achieve after one term of Labour government at Labour Party conference last year. Uh, and we'll do that by um, supporting people who currently rent and faithfully meet their rental payments, which are often very high, every month, into, uh, into being able to afford mortgages, because it's that leap that is often the major problem. And Rachel and I met with mortgage lenders to discuss this and other issues recently and were... Uh, pleased at the level of willingness that there is for the mortgage sector to be able to respond to that with the right sort of government support. We want to restore social housing to the second largest form of tenure um, because there are a million people languishing on social housing waiting lists, as you'll know, and for them, the private rented sector is never going to be a sustainable option. And we want uh, a very good quality, so much higher quality, 
uh, but s slightly smaller private rented sector that provides that choice for those people who need it, but doesn't just act as a sink to, to take all of the people who can't get into the housing tenure that they need. I just want to give you an idea, though, of why of where we think the system has gone badly wrong. And you may recognise this if you live outside of London. The, um, the housing benefit system currently allows private landlords to buy up properties, let them out to people who are considered vulnerable in what's called supported accommodation, provide no support whatsoever, uh, and rake in large sums of taxpayers' money, inflated rates of housing benefit as a consequence. It's a profitable model for a lot of people. And in some parts of the country, Birmingham, Burnley, Bristol, this has blighted entire communities. You've got vulnerable people left with no support. And you've got streets where in, it, whole swathes of the street have been bought up and let out on these short-term lets while the community is left to go to rack and ruin. Now, we think that's an absolute nonsense. Um, meanwhile, you've got local people in every community in this country, Grimsby, Wigan, um, Sunderland, who are using small amounts of money, pooling small amounts of money to buy back the housing stock, do it up to good quality standards, let it out to local people and reinvest in their local community. But every time they try and get small amounts of funding to do that, they bump up against the system when they should feel the whole system pulling in behind them. The system hands power and resources to the wrong people and we're going to tilt it back to people with a stake in the outcome and skin in the game who are in it for the long haul to build communities that work. And that's the approach that we'll take to housing in the next Labour government. Uh, Oscar, uh, on this issue about Section 35, I think this is slightly out with my brief, despite my, <laughs> my job title being that long. But what I will say is that, as, you know, as the, the person who shadows Michael Gove on the uh, future of the union, that we're in this mess because you've essentially got an SNP government and a Tory government who have engineered a row. This is indicative of both the SNP and the Tories that it's in their collective political interest to continue this war. It's not in the interests of people in Scotland, England, Northern Ireland or Wales. This is why the bonds have been fraying that tie the union together. We will take a completely different approach to this in government where we negotiate our way through shared challenges and will work respectfully with governments of other political persuasions if they've been elected by people in any part of the UK in order to help resolve where there are tensions between national governments in Scotland, in Wales, in England and across the UK. Um, lastly, on, um, on local government. So Ra Rachel said something recently that I know a few of you, some of you in this room actually uh, asked me about, about tax raising powers um, and whether the next Labour government would devolve tax raising powers. She was very clear, as am I, that we don't intend as a Labour government at any point to try to increase the tax burden on working families who are already struggling with their finances. But across the country, you've seen some examples, as you know, of innovation where um, I think um, Birmingham was the first to do it, Manchester and Liverpool are following suit, um, where they're, they're, they've introduced a tourist levy, a uh, hotel bedroom tax, for those of you who use that lingo, where people can, who are visitors to the city can voluntarily opt in to pay an extra few pounds on their hotel bill, which then gets reinvested in the city or the city region. Birmingham particularly pioneered this because they had the Commonwealth Games and they could see the opportunity that it created. They don't have the power currently to, um, to, to increase those, to, to levy those taxes on a statutory basis, so they do it on a voluntary basis. You could see it in the levelling up white paper. Uh, the, where I think Andy Haldane particularly wanted to get to was a place where um, local economies, local leaders, are able to raise far more money themselves locally and decide how they spend it. And I will say this, at the moment, the current system doesn't serve anybody well. You've got local leaders having to go cap in hand to Westminster and Whitehall, particularly the mayors, arguing for grants 
to spend on things they want to spend them on. They have to shout and shout and shout. When they eventually get it, they spend it, they come back and they ask for more. It doesn't serve them well, and it doesn't give them the respect that they deserve. It doesn't serve the government well, because they eventually have to just keep handing over these grants. It doesn't serve communities well, because it means that those mayors and local leaders are accountable upwards to the government, but they're not accountable downwards to the people that they serve. But here's the problem, and here's the problem that Michael Gove ran into as well with that agenda is you've, to get from where we are now to a place where local councils and mayors can raise far more money locally and spend it according to local priorities, you've got to bridge the gap. Because some parts of the country, as you know, have a much bigger tax base. And if you simply unleashed all of that and handed control back to local areas, what you'd essentially be doing is allowing some local economies to disintegrate. This is the, this is the conundrum that we're grappling with. We think we, can do, uh, we think we can do a couple of things very quickly that will help local government. We think that we can give longer-term funding settlements so that there's far more ability to plan. And we also think that we can give far more flex in the budget so that local councils are able to spend according to their local priorities, not the government's. And they're two things that we think will be a significant help. But, you know, as always, work with us to help us get to the end destination. I, I think, you know, some, I, I feel confident that we can get there, but you can't get there without a proper plan. Otherwise, you're going to find that some local economies just face the verge of collapse. Thank you. More questions? OK, yep, just at the back of the middle there. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Simon Kay from the Think Tank Reform. Um, I'm intrigued by this question about empowering local places. I wanted to raise a complexity that I struggle with in my research on levelling up and devolution and wondered what, what you thought of it. So, for example, you mentioned the situation in Cumbria where they're pushing ahead with a new coal mine. But this is, if nothing else, a locally driven agenda which has local controversy surrounding it, but which has been spearheaded by local authorities. So there's a category of stuff that happens in local places that we might think is wrong or that we might just disagree with at the centre of government. And I guess the question for a levelling up agenda, for anyone's levelling up agenda, is to what extent does real local autonomy and empowerment actually mean putting up with local decisions about which we disagree? Thank you. And we've got one over here. Hi, excuse me, Sarah Kalkin from Local Government Chronicle. Um, thanks for your comments on fiscal devolution there. That was going to be my question, but actually I wanted to ask you then, so council tax and business rates are obviously a big part of how local government is funded at the moment. What is Labour's plans for the future of those taxes? I think certainly front benches have described them as unsustainable in their current form. Yeah. Thanks. And then one here. Um, this is sort of a bit niche, but um, regarding levelling up, um, Parliament has been in a state of disrepair for quite a while, um, and there have been multiple consultations on it. Do you think it might be an idea, if and when Parliament must be, be vacated, to move it out of London? Would that be a good show of faith in terms of bringing power to the people well, outside of London? <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so to what extent does localism mean putting up with local decisions that you don't like, um, plans for the future of uh, particular taxes, and then what about moving Parliament out of London? And one question from the audience I, online I want to add in is, how do you go about achieving decentralisation without leaving different areas pulling in wildly different directions? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll sort of start there and also the question from reform, because I think in some ways they're, they're sort of similar, um, because you get unintended consequences, right? If you're not in control of everything, you don't control everything. I think we've got to get comfortable with that. Um, I, I think, first of all, the experience in Cumbria, I think, tells you that, um, that there's a real problem when communities are left with very few choices. 
You know, the, what, were they, what were those short-lived things called a few weeks ago? Investment zones, enterprise zones? I can't remember what Simon... <laughs> is, like, I've blanked that entire period of government out of my memory. Liz Truss is but a distant dream. Um, but, you know, these investment zones... I mean, councils around the country were told you've got to apply for them by Thursday or we're not considering you. So they applied thinking that these things were a nonsense and probably not what they wanted at all. But they applied because they had to, because it was the only game in town. And how do you account to your local community if you've turned your face against the only game in town? You know, if you, I would, I would bet a lot of money that if you'd given the community in Cumbria and local leaders the choice of thousands of nuclear jobs, which they were bidding for over a few hundred um, uh, fossil fuel jobs that are already being phased out um, and for which the market is already disintegrating, I, I can bet that they would have opted for the long-term future. And, you know, the, where this comes up the most, I think, is in house building. I'm asked this constantly by national journalists who seem to have a very dim view of the British public. Um, you know, you can't hand power to local communities. You'd never get any houses built. You'd never get any infrastructure projects built. Well, my experience over the last 13 years in a town that has seen significant pressure on some of our villages for housing is that people do want houses built. They want decent, good quality houses, but they want the sort of houses that their kids can get and live in so that they don't have to move away from their grandparents and their childcare and their kids' schools and all the things that help sustain decent places. Instead, what you often get is half a million pound houses in towns where average household incomes are less than 25,000 a year. And if you take communities with you, and you genuinely, it is a conversation with the community that helps to deliver on their ambitions, not just yours, then you tend to find that people pull in the same direction. So, you know, to answer your person online, do you get people pulling in different directions? Well, they'll, they'll do things differently, and we're very comfortable with that. That's how you learn and grow. You know, to give you another example, we've got this great work going on in Grimsby at the moment. There's... Um, a guy called Jason Stockwood, who bought the local football club and is using it as an anchor institution. You're obviously familiar. Um, there's a great group called the East Marsh United, who are on the East Marsh estate, who recognised a long time ago that if change was going to come, it was going to come from themselves. And they're really sort of pressing ahead with helping to give young people from that estate opportunities. You've got this great work going on in the wind industry. And they have really come together and created that magic that starts to revive and to regenerate a place and help all of the local people share in its fortunes. And when Keir and I, when he first appointed me to the job, he said, let's go on a visit. And we went to Grimsby on purpose because I am sick to the back teeth of politicians going to parts of the country like mine, pointing at the boarded up high streets and food banks and saying, isn't it all terrible? There are some great things happening in this country. And the, the point is that they should be able to happen everywhere, not just in some places. But, you know, over in Stoke, there's a similar group of people who are starting to get similar work off the ground. They don't want to do what Grimsby did, but they do want to learn from people in Grimsby. They have different assets and potential in Stoke. You know, this incredible history of the ceramics industry, lots of young people who want to stay and contribute to their community. They're not going to do what Grimsby did, but they can learn and help to share those ideas. And that, you know, in the end, that is how you build a country that, that makes sense again, by drawing on the uniqueness of different places. Sorry, I'm taking too long to answer these. Let me rattle through the others. Um, uh, this question about council tax and business rates, um, we're looking at the, the um, funding formula for council tax at the moment. The problem with what Michael Gove has done in this sort of deal that he cut with the Treasury is that essentially it relies a lot on communities raising their own council tax. So where you've got um, a much lower base from which to draw. You've got lower property prices. Those councils in particular have really lost out through the, the funding settlement. There's got to be a fairer way to do it, and we're currently looking at that with the LGA, amongst others, about how we could do that better. Business rates, um, we've said that we'll freeze reform and eventually scrap business rates. Uh, so we'll freeze them for the first year by uplifting the digital sales tax because there is, a, there is a, a tipping point that many high streets are currently facing at the moment and anything that we can do to ease those pressures 
uh, we will. And should Parliament move outside of London? Well, as long as they don't move it to Wigan, because I don't want to find <laughs> half of Parliament in my local pub. Um, but on a serious note, I do think that the time has come to start modernising Parliament. It's... Uh, has the feel of an old boys network you know private members club you can see from the successive scandals that have been uncovered in recent years that that is not serving anybody well if i had my wish we'd move into a modern office building we'd open parliament up to the people so that they could all share in its heritage and we would get on with governing this country in a way that's fit for the 21st century thank you lisa okay a couple more questions yeah, one at the back there Robert Wright from the Financial Times. Um, you've said warm things about the Brown Review, but the, we've heard very strong indications that the Brown Review wanted to go further on devolution to Wales and Northern Ireland, wanted to give them greater powers, and that uh, the leader of the opposition's office scotched that. So can you tell us a bit about what's gone on there and, and whether that should colour our thinking about your warm words about devolution? Thank you. And then one at the front here. Hi, uh, we just wait for him. Sorry, just wait for a mic. <laughs> Hi, um, Purdy Fraser, and Chair of National Numeracy and on the um, oversight body for the European Social Funds. Um, my question's about how you're going to knit together all the, the great initiatives you're, you're talking about with levelling up strategies and knit that together with the industrial strategy that I think your colleague, colleagues are talking about in um, the Bayes group and the skills, the urgent need to invest in skills. And from my uh, experience of talking about these areas, I've ended up working with like 10 different ministries and it's not joined up. And I was wondering concretely, have you got kind of uh, other ideas about how to bring together coherent policy on, in, on industrial strategy, on, on the skills and on the leveling up? Because it's all part of the piece. Brilliant, thank you. And I want to throw in a question from the audience that relates to that, that joining up point. Um, you know, this is obviously a really ambitious agenda that requires cross-departmental working, something I know that you know, Lisa. Um, how will Labour go about making a success of that? How will it work effectively cross-departmentally? Um, um, well, funnily enough, we were talking to the IFG about this the other day. <laughs> um, you know, what, there, there are various mechanisms within government to make sure that things get delivered. You know, one is through the Cabinet Office, the other is by having dedicated ministers or remits in each department. Uh, cabinet Office subcommittees, which Michael Gove has one. Uh, it's clearly not working, but, you know, it's an idea worth exploring. In the end, though... The most successful examples I've seen of where agendas are delivered across different government departments are when the Prime Minister and, to a large extent, the Chancellor are brought in to that agenda and see it as their personal priority. And I would just say to you that I think that is the importance of... If you look back at the last speeches that Keir, Rachel and I have made, there's a thread running through all of them. This is the only route out of our current crisis. And that's why I'm far more optimistic that we're going to succeed where others have failed, because this is a shared personal priority mm -hmm. for all of us. And, um, uh, you know, regardless of the structures that you create, and structures do matter, as the IFG has often told me, but regardless of the structures that you create, there's no substitute for that. I remember when Ed Bulls was the children's secretary, was made the children's secretary under Gordon Brown. I was working with children, refugee children at the time in the voluntary sector. It was a game changer for those children because for the first time, the Department for Children, Schools and Families trumped the Home Office when it came to priorities. And so those young people were treated as children first and foremost and refugees second. And that meant that their tr the treatment, their legal protections, the standards that were demanded for them completely changed. And that was because Gordon Brown, as Prime Minister, had made it his personal priority to deliver for children in that parliament. I think that's what makes the difference. How do you bring all these different disparate bits together? Well, actually, I think you do it locally. So skills, we've committed, uh, David Blunkett did a review for us on skills, and we've committed to devolving skills budgets and giving far greater flexibility to businesses about how they use the apprenticeship levy. Jonathan Ashworth was recently out talking 
um, at the Centre for Policy Studies, I think, about the, um, the loss of workforce of the over 50s and the need to devolve uh, employment and training support to local communities so that they can equip people for the jobs that exist in those communities, not just have this one size fits all programme. Uh, industrial strategy, Johnny Reynolds has been working on our industrial strategy and it has a place element to it that the you know the the hydrogen uh, industry in Ellesmere Port, the wind industry that I've talked about in Grimsby, manufacturing in Burnley, the, you know there are there are different skills and strengths and assets in every part of the country, and an industrial strategy has to have a place-based element to it, and those communities have to have the tools that they need, whether it's skills transport. Louise Haig has talked about our desire to uh, devolve powers not just over bus franchising which some local leaders have to all but also over rail and trams as well to, to increase connectivity you put those tools into local communities and suddenly they've got the tools to actually drive local growth now it doesn't work unless the local system is far more transparent and accountable um, but if the system is transparent and accountable to the communities that they serve, then instead of this absurd situation where constantly people from all over the country are having to travel to Westminster to beg for small amounts of money and powers, it's an ongoing conversation with your partners in the local community who also are in it for the long haul. It's their kids, it's their family, it's their community, it's their future. And so you get decisions that, that work. And just on this question about the Brown Review and the devolution to Wales and Northern Ireland, um, I, I, we, well, there wasn't a row, as, unless somebody's been hiding things from me, that, and I'm usually involved in every row that there is because uh, of this massively expanded brief that Michael Gove's created for himself and for me. Um, there, there wasn't a row about devolution. There was a conversation about how the how devolution can work in four very different nations of the United Kingdom, obviously very mindful of the particular circumstances in Northern Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement. But one of the recognitions that I think is important in the Gordon Brown report is that for too long we've treated uh, England as if it's all region and no nation, Scotland and Wales as if they're all nation and no region. But actually in Scotland, in Wales, you find very big differences in people's experiences of globalisation and economic growth and sustainable communities over the last, not just 10 years, but 40 years, actually. You find different skills and assets in different parts of the country, different local economies. And, you know, one of the most interesting things I think that's starting to emerge is in Wales, Mark Drakeford has been, and Vaughan have been, looking at economic fiscal devolution, trying to transfer power and resources to uh, parts of South Wales and looking at North Wales as well, where the situation is very, very different. Um, and in Scotland, Anna Sawa recently did an intervention with Andy Burnham talking about the need for uh, mayoral models in Scotland and far more local control. I think this feeling that you get in England around that, it's very similar to the sense that you get in Scotland and Wales. I don't think that politics has been very good at responding to that. Um, and I also think that people haven't been very good at responding to the fact that, you know, people feel very patriotic about their country and it's possible to be, to feel British, to feel English, to feel Scottish, to feel Welsh, to feel both of those things at the same time and to feel, feel very proud of where you come from. Somehow we've got to start getting into a much a uh, more productive conversation where we start to draw on that patriotism as a, a strength in this country. Because I, I believe, and I, I wrote about it in the book, that that quiet patriotism, because people feel a sense of belonging, whether it's to their nation or to their community or to their region, to their city, to their town, it's that quiet patriotism that is spurring people on in every part of our country to build and to create and invest and to be in it for the long term even at a time when so much is being taken from them and so much is falling apart. And I think if we could see that as a force for good, if we could start to harness it and we could pull the whole system in behind those people, we would be in a far, far stronger place as a country.
Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to finish um, with one last question from online. I think we've got a school watching along um, this afternoon. Uh, so Leighton wow. Park School have sent in um, a question. Given the realities of being in power, what do you think will be your biggest obstacle to implementing the plans that you've outlined today? Well, I did want to say that um, I was going to move... I think I said I was going to move Downing Street out of um, Downing Street and move it up north. Uh, <laughs> I'm not totally sure how Keir feels about that, to be honest. Uh, never make promises you can't keep, kids. There's the lesson. Um, what's the biggest obstacle to it? Um, I, I, I'll be really honest. I think that there are some people in this country for whom the system is working pretty well. Mm -hmm. And there aren't a lot of them. Uh, but they tend to hold all the cards. And I think that the biggest challenge that we're going to face is taking that on and governing this country, um, uh, you know, changing the system so that it works for most of us, not just a handful of us. And I think that has been a challenge for any government that's ever tried it. But I think if you, if you look at some of the conversations that we, we are leading at the moment, whether it's on the devolution agenda and changing where power lies in this country after a century of centralisation, whether it's a conversation we're having about reform of the National Health Service, not just protecting the National Health Service, but fundamentally changing it so that it works for most people, the people who work in it and the people who use it. I think you can see that there is a, not just a willingness, but a strong desire to do things differently at the heart of the Labour Party that Keir leads. I think everyone in this country has known it for a long time, since 2008, since the global financial crash. I think people have known that we can't go on like this, that essentially we've got an economy that we work harder for than I can ever remember. You know, most of my constituents doing two, three jobs just simply to make ends meet, not being able to spend time with their families, only one payday away from disaster. And I think there's been a lot strong sense in this country for about 15 years now that we can't go on like this. It's just that politics hasn't caught up. Well, we're going to catch up and we're not going to put anything in that manifesto that we don't know that we can deliver. But we're not going to allow that to limit our ambitions because these are the moments. These are the moments where everything feels broken. These are the moments where real fundamental change becomes possible. So I am, you know, alive to the difficulties but we're up for the struggle. Brilliant. Thank you, Lisa. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. Um, thank you so much for a brilliant discussion. I thought a perfect balance between setting out your vision, but also in true Institute for Government style, <laughs> talking about the wiring that you need to deliver on it. Um, thank you also to the audience for a brilliant set of questions, both in person and online. Thank you. <laughs>